Yeah, welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name Podcast. This is going to be a fun one, by the way, so hold tight. Let's introduce or reintroduce the legendino into the conversation. Hello, Tim. Yeah, this is one of those where you can't take anything for granted. Kenny, you? you've got to wait until right at the end to know what's going to happen. Yeah, as you know, on the Brazilian Shirt Name Podcast, we always cast our minds back to an iconic game in somewhere in the football uh, firmament iconic for all sorts of reasons and today's game is iconic because it was a cracker of a game to be fair you know we're talking Champions League final 1999 Manchester United versus uh, Bayern Munich and the person that has agreed to come and talk to us all about it is Sam Collins uh, filmmaker and uh, well he writes his own narrative so I'll let him tell you what else he does hello Hello, hello. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, you've only been on a minute and I've already stolen one of your lines, haven't I? Well, I, I mean, look, I was just, um, it's a, a big blank, the whole thing. That's what filmmaking is, really. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, but like you say, you write your own narrative through film or otherwise. But in terms of trying to do a documentary about Manchester United, you've got to stick to the objective, don't you? You, you have to follow the uh, the paper trail or the success trail whatever it is yeah absolutely and do whatever you can not to upset Manchester United fans it turns out <laughs> that is uh it's its own ecosystem yeah exactly <laughs> how, how have you managed to upset them no we haven't I don't I, I don't I was I was just uh I was joking there but um no I think I think it's it's been really interesting I'm not sure I was quite aware quite how big the Manchester United fan base was I know that sounds stupid but it is its own very much sort of its own ecosystem and you so I, I suppose it's a lot of responsibility um telling a story that so many people have so much ownership over you know that it plays such an integral part in a lot of people's lives you know that's what football is um the last time I was speaking to you guys was about Gaza which was a very very different sort of story you know that, that was not so much a story about on the pitch about what happened to him off it mm. this is very much a story about success on the pitch and and that anniversary that we had you know it's we're speaking on what the 28th of may yesterday was the 25th anniversary of the parade sunday was the of the of the final itself in barcelona and those days you know i think we've, we've just seen an outpouring of of stories of people you know this is like the fundamental moments in a lot of people's lives mm. and you're trying to re we're trying to you know we we set out a year and a half ago, two years ago, to reimagine that, to recontextualize it. And um that is it is a responsibility. I hope we've done a good job, but um yeah. And and you Just... sold it to Amazon, which is a great thing. Um this is an Amazon documentary. Fantastic that they understand football fandom, that there is a market for a documentary like this or a documentary series like this, um a, a amongst you know potential Amazon customers. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we we I have to say there's not me doing the selling as much as I'd love to big myself up. I mean, David um, Beckham and Gary Neville's production companies were were involved in the production of this. So they I think they felt um, that Studio 99 and, and Buzz 16. I was working for a company called Ventureland, who also were involved in the David Beckham series. Um, and, and, you know, they're all brilliant companies. Great sort of um understanding of both both film cinema etc and you know yeah exactly i suppose stories that people want to listen to and um and, and amazon have been fantastic in terms of backing our uh what's the right word you know this is this is a subject that's been covered a lot and i think the cell you know that the important thing to try and get across right from the beginning to all these people was that we could tell a story that was different and that amazon have been incredibly supportive in in that it's fascinating to uh, first of all, the first thing I want to I want to discuss with you is is that fan base, that Man United yeah. fan base, because it is it's different, isn't it? Firstly, I think United broke the mold in in our country in having a national fan base, which wasn't really something which was part of English football culture, uh, which is quite unusual. There are there are a lot of countries that have national teams. You know, Benfica in Portugal, for example. You know, English football didn't have that. And no one would have thought in like the mid-40s when Matt Busby goes to United that United would have that. You know, but you get that the the fact that Busby understood, a little bit like people say with Klopp and Liverpool, you know, Busby understood the city 
Now, we represent a grey industrial city. Our mission is to bring colour and drama to this place. Yeah. Uh, and doing that so successfully, and then the tragedy. And that, I think, unleashes a wave of sympathy that transforms United into a, into a national club. And then you get the internationalisation of it. And there's a lovely uh, interview I heard, from, it was from Bobby Charlton, talking about being in, in Asia, it might have been Japan, during a United game. And it's the middle of the night, uh, and there's a United goal. And all around his hotel, he sees people yelling and cheering. And it's a moment where he realises, blimey, this is a global community. It's a worldwide community. And it, it, it belongs to, to, to everyone. So I, I'm imagining that you're finding the 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 size of this of this fan base in the course of of of, of your of who you're trying to tell the story to, and how have you tried to make the story different? How have we tried? To, well, I suppose um, firstly, I think that what we've tried to do is tell the story. We tried to weave across three episodes, um, three episodes about fifty five minutes each. And they, you tell the story of the season, um, you know, it starts, for the frame is the 10 days in which Manchester United stand on the, the precipice of immortality. You know, it's basically three games in 10 days. If you win them, you become immortal. If you fail, you're haunted by that failure forever. And that's the context. And, and then... Well, you say, it is a you know it's a huge it is like you try to tap into those universal. You themes think a man cutting his toenail is Shakespeare? You find it the bard be. in everything, don't it you? It can be uh, to be or not to be. That is the toenail. <laughs> <laughs> and um, well, it's not this one's not about Gary Lineker though. Not no, no big toes. No, is it? no, 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 the, no, no. The toenail is VAR, mate. You know that's Shakespeare yeah, exactly. right there. The um, not if arson has anything to do with it anymore, no. but he they... did not see anything, Tim. This is your line about <laughs> Arsene Wenger. He did not see it, he did not see it, but he certainly had to see this, didn't he? Because everyone was watching United against Bayern Munich on May the 26th, 1999. Well, exactly. And and I think what we tried to do is try to understand that each of the players in that squad, you know, some of their stories have been told a lot, the class of 92, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, some of them have been told less. You know, the final, Jesper Blomqvist is, is probably one of my favourite contributors in the final. Talking about, you know, his his story in the final is very much about somebody who is overwhelmed by the scale and the magnitude of that occasion. And I, th I think where we started in terms of conceptually, had a brilliant team of working, you know, you do a lot of research on stuff like this, is, is looking at it and saying 89 minutes, Manchester United losing 1-0. What if that game, you know, what what was being written in the press box at that moment? What mm. were the narratives that were going to be entrenched by that defeat? And of course, and th that, this is still a time of the written press, isn't it? Well, 1999. So, you know, what absolutely. they're going to write and, and the, 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 the poor souls there, they're under deadline pressure. So that they've they've got to write and they've got to file very, very quickly. Exactly. And, you know, the the well, we we know the headlines that were being written is Alex Ferguson has failed on the biggest night of his life. He has dropped the ball. He's been overwhelmed by the occasion. He's picked the wrong team. He's doubled down on it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is more proof that he does not have what it takes to win Europe's biggest prizes. Harsh, harsh. Very, very, very <laughs> it harsh. It is harsh. All, but always history is predictions harsh. predictions after the event. Always. Yeah. History is harsh, you know. Yeah. And that that was the sort of, that was the point, you know, that you forget, I think, that the first episode, which is the sort of first half of that season, you start that season, you know, United had lost the double in 97, 98. At that stage, Ferguson has not won a, a bean without Eric Cantona. You know, Cantona's left 97, 98, Keane did his cruise ship. And that young team that everybody thought was winners had fallen apart in the in the sort of, well, I say fallen apart, but the perception was that they weren't good enough. They'd lost to Monaco in the quarterfinals of Europe. They'd lost to Barnsley in the FA Cup. Mm -hmm. And in the league, they'd been, you know, Arsenal had overturned a sort of 10, 11 point lead or whatever it was in the second half of that season. So there was very much that that question. There were questions around so many of that, the people in that club, you know, Andy Cole question, is he good enough to do it at the highest level? You know, Cole, you know, told, but said, you know, described to us as a man apart at the beginning of that season. And so I suppose what you then do is you then layer the, the narrative to see 
all the different people. Peter Schmeichel, first half of that season, has an absolute, you know, he retires. He'd retired before the start of that season privately. We we only show him doing it publicly in about November. But he's throwing it in his net through the, a lot of the first half of that season. And, and you know, so he has many questions to answer. So what you're trying to do is, I suppose, give the context of all of these different people, how their narratives sort of intertwine, what's at stake for them in that one match. We're really in that one, you know, the 10 days, but the one match in Barcelona. And that is, um, yeah, I, it, it, to, to me, what what we had the scope to do was give it the context that perhaps it hasn't been given in the previous tellings. You know, even United's European history, the failures in Galatasaray in 93, in Barcelona and mm-hmm. and, and, and um, Gothenburg in 94, the uh, failure against Monaco in 98, Dortmund in 97, and the impact on the players those had as well. Yeah. So this, these long I'm, answers. I'm, I'm glad. No, well, no. I like the long answers, personally, because you covered a lot of ground there. Uh, the you, you mentioned Turkey in uh, Galatasaray. But of course, this is, isn't it, the equivalent of Liverpool's miracle in Istanbul. I know we're giving away the ending, but a lot of people know that ending uh, by now. But I suppose it's difficult as a filmmaker uh, to make Barcelona rhyme, you know, because I could only come up with the <laughs> the lymphoma in Barcelona <laughs> or <clears throat> the melanoma in Barcelona uh, or the glaucoma in Barcelona. Uh, any improvements on that? Apart from the aroma, obviously, in Barcelona, which is mainly on the plane. <laughs> the, uh, the the Mona in Barcelona might have been. Um, I don't know. That's that's putting me under a lot of it's pressure. A difficult one. It's a difficult one. I'm going to hand Pomona over to Tim. To Barcelona. Very nice. A Pomona yes. to Barcelona. Oh, you missed the trick there. Um, but you've got to do it in the. I'll offer it for free. Yeah, there you go. Take it away. Use but, it. And you've pretty much explained why 1999, because you could almost chosen the drama of any uh, European Cup final or Champions League final. There is an you know intrinsic drama in all of these things, um, Shakespearean or otherwise. 1999, though, is something special for all the reasons that you've mentioned and some of the reasons that, you know, you haven't, kind of delved into very much. You mentioned Schmeichel's last match, for example. You mentioned Jesper Blomqvist there, and you gave us an aspect to him uh, that perhaps you wouldn't have known otherwise. And he does miss a goal very mm. early on that could have put Manchester United, uh, was it 1-0 or 1-0, I think, at that point, to put them at 1-0. And there are all these other things going on. There's a particular relationship between... Dwight York and Andy Cole uh, that manifests itself um, and had done throughout that season, I seem to remember, but certainly manifests itself to a certain extent on this pitch. But even though, um, and Bayern Munich, because you could have done this film from the Bayern Munich perspective, that feels like a proper... I'm not sure that any Germans would have bought it unless they were were fans of Dortmund. Well, but as with Manchester United, Bayern Munich has got fans all over the world. But apart from that, it's the drama of the occasion. And what I remember most about this match, again, I'm giving away the ending after the full-time whistle, that there was one black man on the pitch bawling his eyes out. And I couldn't mm-hmm. believe it. You know, I'd never seen that before in the football. Mm-hmm. I'm not making a, a race thing of it, I promise you. Mm-hmm. But what's his name? Little Sammy. Before. What's before. before the big I could event. not yeah. believe what a Champions League, not winning a Champions League final could do to somebody. Well, it was you know, it's so... It, 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 it he was unconsolable. He was yeah. unconsolable. And the guy had played a pretty decent match. And then I saw this and I thought, oh, my goodness, it's not a joke. These are grown men crying their eyes out over a match, is what I remember from their perspective. Do you remember watching the match, Sam? I do. I do. But, but that was the thing. Like, I'm a Tottenham fan. But United were, I, you know, disclosure, like, I can't stand Man City now. They're nothing about If they're on the television, I turn them off. Like, there's just nothing... 
It's not just a a, a, a naked ploy for Manchester United jealous. fans, but, just but it's, <laughs> no. But there's nothing about them that it's clinical. It's like egotistic. I just don't nothing about it's a Manchester winning formula. City you know makes the me enjoy football. But but Fer, yeah. that's the point. Though Ferguson's winning formula was about sort of doing do. There was a there was a like a risk that it all comes back to risk. His force of personality. All I remember is when I was a kid, and United were on the telly. You wanted to watch them. It was exciting, and it was just the the way that they they played. There was like a spirit, an openness to it. That well, Ferguson I don't know, got for the he got the Busby legacy. He was the yeah. first one that they'd had since Busby, who wasn't intimidated by the Busby legacy. Perhaps mm. it was easier because enough time had had had, had gone by. Yeah, um, but. I remember vividly, vividly watching a game. I, I remember quite a lot of the campaign, even though I was I was already in, in Brazil, because it was glamour ties against glamour clubs, wouldn't it? You know, this they're mm. in the same group as not only Bayern but Barcelona as well. Yeah, you know, and one of those teams is is, is going to miss out. So you know, they they crunch games all the way through, and then they do get through that group, two, three, three draws with 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 Barcelona. Crazy, uh, and then because the English are still off the pace, really. In, in the the Champions League. They're still off the pace. And the clubs that you're still looking to as the big ones are Italy. Yeah. And they get they get through Inter Milan and they get through Juventus. They have to dig them at themselves out of a mm -hmm. hole. Mm -hmm. So they they've overcome some really great teams to to reach the final. And then the Ferguson has this problem of how do I pick the team? Because mm -hmm. Roy Keane's gone and he's injured. No Roy Keane. What do you do then? You lose one of your centre backs. You lose Burr. What do you what What do you do then? And it's that that, as the game unfolded in Barcelona against Bayern in the final, many people thought that he got wrong. Well, that was that was our concept. You know, the first two episodes are all about his extraordinary strength of belief and character. You know, so you think, look at it, Juventus, he has that great moment before the game. You know, the first leg has been, you know, they've almost been played off the park. There's this narrative that he's too open in Europe, that English teams aren't sophisticated enough. He's not sophisticated enough. That first leg, Conte scores relatively early. Juventus could have had three or four. After the game, Gig snatches an equaliser. After the game, he pulls the team together. Steve McLaren tells this beautifully and says, you know, look, I get that the critics, people say we're not good enough to win in Europe. They say that 4 4 is outdated. That's the way we play. Stick with me. Stay with me. And then they go to Turin and go 2 nil down, you know, which is crazy. And he yeah. just said he doubles down. That's what he does mm -hmm. under pressure. In those moments, he doubles down and in exactly the same way he did when everything was going wrong. Brian Kidd was leaving, Schmeichel's retiring, first half of that season, doubles down. And so the the our, the concept for our third episode was what happens when it goes wrong? You know, so right. Ferguson, he's take, he takes, you know, you're, you're missing Keenan Scholes in the final. Whether Scholes would have played, I don't know. He hadn't played in the quarters or the semi. What had happened against Inter is he'd actually played where he'd actually played Ronnie Johnson in centre mid. So there was a world he could have, uh, arguably, if Berg hadn't been injured, he would have played Ronnie Johnson in centre mid with yeah. um, with Nicky Butt, Beckham wide right, Giggs wide left. The the issue that we sort of, I suppose, honed in on, and, and I, when I say honed, we honed in on, it's really because that was the narrative that all the players were talking about when you when you prized their actual thoughts out. And when you listened to what the commentators were saying at the time and everyone was saying at the time, you're like, hang on a minute, this is the narrative that, everybody seems to have sort of forgotten here that in the biggest game of the season, you had a team that, as Gary Neville described it, played like clockwork. They knew exactly what was happening. And suddenly you move Ryan Giggs to the right. He doesn't like playing on the right. He'd hardly played on the right. Play David Beckham in the middle, who, you know, he, play, he plays a brilliant game in the middle, but that it's what it removes from the team on the mm. right-hand side. This is all to accommodate Jesper Blomquist, who Steve McLaren talks about having said, before the game, you know, look, Jesper's not played, you know, he's had a difficult first season in England. He's lost confidence generally over the last few years. He's not played for two or three weeks. He's not feeling sure of himself. Are you, do you really want to do this? And Ferguson says, you know, I've picked my team. Jesper plays. And it Ferguson goes from is, is, is there. fascinating with this, isn't he? because we know really they, they kind of agreed with his critics. He agreed that, they had to move on from 4-4-2 when they were too open. And that's the direction that he subsequently went. 
Absolutely. But, but he wanted to win first, didn't he? Exactly. Yeah. And it's, but one of the things that's fascinating to me about him, I saw it was Carlos Queiroz, who on two occasions was one of his assistants there. And the, although Ferguson stayed, the assistant kept on changing. You know, that was that was an element of change. And and Queiroz stressed that Ferguson lived by this motto. After a disappointing season, we don't invest. We give confidence in what we've got. When we win, that's when we invest because then we've got to promote competition within the squad. We've got to shake it up because we, we ain't going to do exactly the same as we did last year. And I think that that kind of man, that whole man management thing is, is fascinating. Mm. And the whole commitment to an idea that he probably already knows at this stage he's going to change. Yeah. Absolutely. But he still doubles down on it. It is. It's, it's amazing, this. And that's what he does in that in that game. You know, McLaren says to him at half time. I mean, the players are thinking through that first half. They're thinking this just isn't working. You know, as Gary Neville described it, that clock is just broken. You know, you don't have. You know, he's never played with Giggsy really on that side. You know, you can see no one quite knows where they're supposed to be. McLaren says at half time, "Look, are you sure you don't want to change it?" And he says, "No, absolutely not." You know, he has that faith, that belief. And even even when he does change it, when Teddy Sheringham comes on in the 67th minute or whatever, he then goes to 4-3-3 with Beckham and Giggs narrow. So you still don't have the flow. And it only changes in the 85th minute when suddenly you see, you watch the game, suddenly that's when it happens. And the, the game know? could easily have been totally out of United's reach by then, couldn't it? Absolutely. You know, it's, it's like Absolutely. Napoleon says of his generals, you know, the... The, the the one biggest thing that he wants from his generals is be lucky. You know, yeah. Mehmet Scholl hits the post. Oh, uh, Yanka hits the crossbar. Oh, and Bayern could, could have been kick. out and away and clear, yeah. you know. Yeah. And, and, the, and the really interesting thing about it, you know, when you talk about that belief, because if the whole thing was built almost, I, I mean, I sort of, our second episode, I would say loosely is the, it, it, it is a sense of the creation of a cult. <laughs> You know, right. the, the indoctrination and the the sense of, I say loosely because it's, you know, it's reading between the lines, but that was sort of our thought process was you get the sense, these guys, the belief that they have in his project is total and complete. And the really interesting thing, particularly interesting thing about Barcelona is that you get, you know, Phil Neville saying from the touchline, for the first time, I began to wonder if this was meant to be, this was going to happen, you know, i.e. that what had actually happened in that, sort of 45 to 85 minutes is that the players had started perhaps to lose that belief for the first time. So had you know, they lost the game, that would have serious consequences. Well, who knows? You know, we don't know because as Peter Schmeichel said, you know, I would say he got lucky, but I can't because he got it right. He got it perfectly right. You know, because he did, you know, that actually when push came to shove in the 85th minute, something did twig in his brain that what he needed to give them was that familiarity of going back to their normal positions, mm -hmm. you know, and the flow of confidence, the shot, the jolt of familiarity that that gave them seems to be, and it's not just, I mean, as I say, my job really is just, or my team's job is really to pull together the, the words of the players, you know, Gary Neville talks about this a lot, you know, that the moment it changed was when David Beckham went right and Ryan Giggs went wide left. And you see those final moments, Giggs putting the ball in from the left, Beckham and Neville interchanging. You know, when Dwight York misses that sitter from the five-yard line, or six-yard line or whatever it is, because they've had that interchange. And it's um, it's funny that in that big moment, that all it really took at that stage to get them back was, was just that moment where they could really trust the instincts they'd built over the last 10 years or whatever together. You know, it's uh, really fascinating hearing uh, the analysis, uh, not least the analysis of uh, Salix Ferguson's strategy, etc. Because on the one hand, it's like a chess game. You know, it's like um, what do you do when you lose your queen? I think the way that you uh, put it, Sam, was you know what do you do when things go wrong? It's like a chess match, but at the same time, it's like a a business course. You know, a course in business, and I'm not surprised that. Uh, Ferguson was, uh, you know, a guest lecturer, I think Harvard University Business School, if I recall rightly, because through through the analysis of a football match, there's so much going on that tells you how you structure a successful business. Uh, shit does happen 
in business all the time and you've got to react to it. But at the same time as well, you've got to be very confident of your starting point because if you're not confident from at the point that you start, then everything else falls apart. And either you abandon shit completely and then restart or you've got to stick to your guns because there was something in that initial thought process that you know urged you to go in that direction i think it's more like a business lecture you know that's what you got you can learn which from which, this. which leads me to a question which will now um cause mr sam collins great embarrassment go on. Uh, because to what extent do you think the ferguson legacy is sullied by the blessing or help that he gave easing in the Glazers in what has clearly been in business terms, an absolute catastrophe for not Manchester from, United. For Manchester United, not for the Glazers though. Well, isn't that the point? Oh, that's uh, thanks for that one, Tim. Yeah. That's great. That's known question. as a hospital pass. Well, it, the thing is, I was just thinking because it goes, and I'm going to, I'm going to sort of slightly say that it's a bit like Jim Ratcliffe I, saying, uh, yes, yeah. Brexit's going to be great. You know, why do we listen to these people? But there you go. But that was, you know, that that obviously comes with so much baggage. It goes right back to the first episode of this. You know, if I, I'm just going to, like any great politician, put or not, you know, pull it back to the the the, the <laughs> film. But you know, the first episode of this is is very much about the 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 sort of behind the scenes stuff. We actually couldn't mention the Sky Deal in the series. I say we couldn't. We just couldn't fit it in. But that was all going on. There's a lot of warfare behind the scenes between Ferguson and, and Martin Edwards. And actually, you know, Brian Kidd was involved in that. Again, de detail too far for the for the series. But uh, essentially, this this where Ferguson is at this stage, he's not Sir Alex at this point. He's not, I, I think at the beginning of that season, he's not the best paid manager in the league, despite the success that he's given. There's a fragility to his position um, and a sense of, you know, a lot of it comes back to money and power, doesn't it? You know, in a sense of who has given Manchester United the success. It's slightly like the last dance. There's that, there's the argument, you know, is it about the executive or is it about the coach? You know, who has been the fundamental figure in the in the success? And, and I think there's that a lot of that going on with United at this point. The reason I say that is because everything that's happened with the Glazers then is all about Manier and McManus, which was all about ownership of United and all about, I would, I would contend without... I, I would speculate without having without claiming to be an expert on this that it was a lot of their involvement in the club was all about didn't it come back to Ferguson trying to cement his own position and and the the sort of politics the the internecine politics behind the scenes that all went very wrong um, around the rate you know the the, the Rock of Gibraltar etc. I mean it, it's a it, it's a I think I think what you what we tend to think of with these. You tend to think of these institutions as these huge uh, things with um, unbelievable sort of structures, governance structures, all these types of things. But really, they're just boil down to people and ego and ambition. And all of that can get very complicated. Is that that's I think you've, you've probably got my vote. <laughs> I don't know what I've said. I tried to say nothing. There. That was brilliant. It was brilliant. <laughs> yeah, keep your options open on July yes. the fourth, Sam, because you never know. If I end up uh, walking into Ten Downing Street, there's a there's a room available there for all of us. I think. But um, on, on on another note, though, um, the I suppose the great drama of this particular match is that it turns on a sixpence in extra time and a stoppage time a stoppage time apologies yeah. we stoppage. don't get to extra time no, no. We? Well, well, the question i was going to make this is the point i was uh, exactly the point i was trying to make was that um when uh sheringham scores the equalizer there doesn't seem to be a great rush from the Manchester United player who picked the ball out of the net to get the ball back in the you know centre circle and to get an extra goal. I don't think. Well, no, no one, picked. no one's imagining that exactly. you can do it at the exactly. But I think Apart from 30, one man within thirty seconds. What that's super sub? Go on, Sam. No, no. I, I guess I mean you've got. I think that you know that this is sort of relatively. I think Teddy and Ole are just thinking. Great, we get another half an hour. Yeah. 
on this incredible pitch, you know, and the, the momentum's changed. And, Mc, and Steve McLaren, you can see him saying to the manager, right, what should we do? Because at this point, they're playing 4-4-2 with Dwight York's dropped in, Teddy and Ole up front. And and um, Steve, you know, but f- I suppose notionally 4-3-3, 4-4-2. And Steve McLaren is, I think, saying, do we pull York back into central midfield? And go more orthodox. And and uh, Sir Alex or uh, Alex Ferguson just says to him, "Look, Steve, sit down, be quiet. This game's not over." And that's the the rush. You can then feel the the ball is almost sucked into the net from that point, isn't it? Because by that point, Solskjaer's got the ball down by the corner flag, shifts it, crosses, goes behind, and it's what, what, what's the last thing? The last thing that Bayern Munich want to face at that moment. It's another David corner, Beckham. isn't it? Yeah. Well, they, they've just conceded from a corner where they really should have cleared the ball. They, they had an opportunity. One of the defenders had a, a welly it, son. And it's a weak clearance that, that then, then comes back. And so the last thing that you want is a corner because a corner, those dreadful moments when Beckham goes across, you know, the, the entire Bayern defence thinking, no, 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 can't, no, 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 can't, 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 can't happen. And it's almost as that they are participating in their own in their, in their own disaster. It's almost as if, sometimes I, I think it's almost as if when sides are defeated like this, it's almost as if they kind of want it in a way. You know, it, it's it's the worst thing in the world, but they kind of want it. It's a little bit like a kid. I've got a grandson and he was staring at this chilli sauce bottle thinking, I'm going to drink that. I'm going to drink that. And he's been told time and time and time again, don't and he's like, no, I'm, I'm going to drink that. And he's almost hypnotised by it. And he, he ends up drinking it, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's almost like sometimes I, I think teams can be collectively hypnotised by we're going down, we're going down, you know. And I, I felt that from Bayern Munich at that, at that point. Yeah, I know. I, I was I was thinking when you were describing that, I was thinking like being a cricketer when you go out and you you want to get out. At a certain moment, you know, weirdly, you just for some reason, you just want to be you just want it to be over. And I think I, th- I think this goes back to what I was saying about that, that the thing that that change, I think, on 85 minutes, if it did anything, it allowed because that was obviously how many times over the course of that season and in the last few years had they won games in the last few minutes? You know, the, the United, that team, they they had that extraordinary self-belief that they could generate almost by will, by the force of their will and the, their personality, they could generate those types of moments. That's why Schmeichel goes up, you know, for that corner, causing, you know, it's, it's chaos theory, isn't it, at that point? And I suppose that um, that what the significance of that change was that it it sort of, I think, put them in the, that mindset, you know, that they yeah. had, they're like, suddenly they're like, they're no longer thinking, oh, it's not quite working. They're now thinking right we know what we're doing here and it's they just I, I think Schmeichel said that Ferguson rang him up after Schmeichel wrote in his book that um that he uh, Sir Alex rang him up after uh after he'd criticized the team selection of the final and said that it had all been a plan that he knew that when Lothar <laughs> Mateus went off that they would uh that Bayern would fold and and uh you know and I'm sure there is a part of that but that you definitely get that sense of the relentlessness just overwhelming them in that it's like waves on, on a sort of beach defense or something, isn't it? By that final moment, I think until that point, you could argue that Bayern was a better team, couldn't you? Oh, without doubt, yes. Yeah. You know, it's so many chances to to to, to bury it. Uh, that, that's that's not up for dispute, is it, Sam? I don't, I don't, I don't know. Some people would say that United held their own. Basically, Bayern went up early. Bayern don't. Which then is a, go. It's, a, it's a Schmeichel mistake, isn't it? Really, they get yeah. it's a goal from a free kick, Mario Basler, and Schmeichel yeah, he he just puts, some, he sets up the wall. The wall in, yeah. in, 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 so you can't see, and he admits it's a mistake. Yeah. Right. You know, and and I think the thing is, you know what, you know, traditional without generalising about Bayern or German teams that when they go one nil up early, they're not then going to try and kill it off four nil by half time. Bayern sit in. United look toothless without their their threats. Yeah. Dwight York and Andy Cole have probably their most ineffective games of the season. Because Dwight, there's no supply but, from the flanks. Yeah, Dwight was overwhelmed, I think. he Or, or looked overwhelmed. I don't want to talk for him. I think, you know, he, he talked about the fact that he'd missed the FA Cup final the previous week, meant that he felt really out of rhythm. Um, 
you know, and uh, and and then I think the that what happens obviously in the second half is that United Blomqvist misses that good chance in the fifty seventh minute or whatever to for, to, to equalise. He comes off. They go four three three with Sheringham wide left, and um, I think York wide right and Cole up uh, and and Cole up front, and it's just a bit of a mess. And that's when I think there's that basically sixty seven to eighty one or whatever when um when Solskjaer comes on that's when United or maybe just after that that basically United concede Bayern could have scored two or three in that period mm -hmm. because United are pushing forward but without any great shape or structure offensively or def defensively not really looking like scoring themselves and then do you get what I mean so it's not it's not that United are terrible it's just that they don't have any real attacking cohesion and then it changes really in that last six or seven minutes. Sounds like a fascinating series. Uh, can't wait to see all of it, actually. Well, just the, just the way it, this is a little bit, you mentioned um, yourself as a cricketer, Sam. Yeah. And this is a little bit like one of the wonderful things about, say, a test match at its best is you can get all kinds of different moods in the course yeah. of the same day, sometimes even in the course of the same session, you know. Uh, and the way that you're seeing a football, this football game is a little bit like that, you know. There's there's a, there's a session there where Bayern are on top, and then a little change, and so it, it, it's it's ninety six minutes as a sequence. It's like a documentary well, in itself. Well, yeah, and and it, look, they always say with Test cricket that you have the individual player narratives. You know, there's so many things at stake for individual players, and that's what makes Test cricket great is this endless supply of narrative. And so I suppose you could say that what we try to do over the course of the season is to give you a sense of what's at stake for each of those individual players. Mm -hmm. You know, so when you see Jesper miss that chance, you understand that he's been in his hotel room the night before the game writing affirmations, that he feels overwhelmed by the by the responsibility that's been placed in him by Ferguson. Wow. That, you, that when you see Teddy come on, you've seen Teddy's arc over the 10 days, which has been from a guy you know, who has who has basically scored three times all season, has been marginalised by the arrival of York and the partnership with Cole, and then is pulled into the final game against Tottenham out of nowhere because Ferguson's making a point to Cole and drops him. Dragged off at half-time, um, you know, unbelievably frustrated. Thinks, you know, FA Cup final, he's on the bench again. He's thinking, what am I doing here? Comes off the after seven minutes, scores, you know, is mad of the match. Everybody, you know, suddenly that you know, he says in his words, the roller coaster, then he's on the bench again for the final, then pulled on, changing the game. So, so, you know, all of these, that's what we tried to have tried to do is weave these individual stories, you know, and, and, you know, it, really it all comes back to the manager and, um, and, and trying to make clear what's at stake for him as well. The one that fascinates me most is probably the least glamorous, which is Ronnie Janssen. Yeah. Because... He stops. I him. saw well, I saw him for Tottenham Reserves. We had him on trial early nineties. Really? Uh, I did yes. not know that. Him and, and, and Leon Arson came over. Okay. Uh and I used to go along to reserve games when I was free and I saw him for Tottenham Reserves. And Leon Arson didn't do much. And he ended up going back to the club later on. You know, he went off to Wimbledon and someone. But Jonsson, I thought, blimey, this fella is so, so classy. Yeah. Bring him in. Bring him in. And for some reason, it didn't happen. And he went away. And he ended up playing for for United in a, in a Champions League final. And in a quiet way, I think he was such a cracking player. Really, mm -hmm. really good, good player. I think it's a bit, it's him who gives away the foul, isn't it, for the goal for Mario Basler's free kick, which I think is very unlike, unlucky. I'm, I'm not sure it is. It, it was a foul there. But he was he was one of those, one of those only, as you could say, he was class enough to play centre, centre midfield. But he was one of those defenders who was so good that often you don't notice how good he was, because mm. he wasn't a, a he, he wasn't a, a kind of King Kong beat the chest kind of centre back. He's just quiet, unassuming, gently nipping the ball away from the attacker. That's uh, exactly so, what he did. Yeah, That's and his exactly. story as the least glamorous member of the side is is one that that fascinates me. Just because I thought I saw him a few years earlier at Tottenham, I thought, please, can we keep him? Yeah, well, there's a lot of unsung heroes in that team. Look at Dennis Irwin as well. Yeah. 
you know, the reverence, Ma- like the, the reverence that his teammates have for him is is striking, isn't it, Dennis Irwin? Yeah, yeah. David May, who was such a sort of important character in the dressing room, you know, Dwight. I mean, that's that that was one of the sort of extraordinary things that I hadn't quite realised how important Dwight York's personality had been in the development of that season. Mm-hmm. You know, that this is a that that really you're looking at a almost like a hostile environment early on. And then Dwight York comes in and the the joy that he brought, i.e. that, you know, that if Cantona had, had given that that team in the early 90s something completely different in terms of confidence, that maybe that what Dwight brought in that season was was a sort of irreverence, like a, a sense of uh, uh, lighting a fuse in the dressing room almost, of bringing some level of joy to it that perhaps had been missing. Well, that's his words, really. Wasn't it you, your lot, Tim, that used to sing... Teddy, Teddy, Sheringham went to Man United and he won for a call. Mm-hmm. Wasn't it your luck? Well, that's after I've gone. So uh, you, you, know, but you, you can't you can't pin that on on, on me. No, we, we did used to do as everyone used to do. Yeah, of course. To the tune of uh, of son of my father. Yeah. Folded, I was folded. I was preformed packed, which is just perfect <laughs> for the name of Teddy Sheringham. It does. Um, obviously, a documentary has a soundtrack, and we always look at the soundtracks of any particular era of football that we talk about. Um, have you had a look? Yeah, at- what is the soundtrack? I mean, we did we did one with um, Johnny Owen, who mm. did a documentary about the glory years of Nottingham Forest. Yeah, yeah, so I believe in miracles. Like, it's great. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. And right. we, we asked Johnny about you know what was the soundtrack, uh, and uh, he said it was a disco. Of that age, it kind of yeah. you know it, it kind of summed up. Had to be, so, didn't it? What was the, what's the soundtrack to to your to your films then? Apart from We've Prince's, got... you know, no, we're going to party like it's nineteen ninety nine. Apart from that one, you can't go there. <laughs> no, we had we had two brilliant composers, Roger Gula and Rafferty. Some of it we wanted it to feel a bit like a night out, the whole thing really. And then we've got Needle Drops. We've got a bit of Ian Brown, um, Set My Baby Free. We have mm. got what else have we got we've got we've actually got um one of my favorite bits is um when we're telling the united backstory um you've got noel gallagher liam gallagher you know they basically the the oasis on stage saying who the i don't am I allowed to swear on this yeah oh, God, oh, get well, it out yeah. of your system man you'll feel better for it <laughs> so say you know saying um who the fuck are man united and then but you, you got to do any accent that goes in <laughs> i'm not going to do that tim that goes into uh, don't go away which is one of you know i know that it's obviously city fans talking about you know but it's but actually the words for don't go away are so perfect for what they were saying about ferguson which is that he needs more time to win in europe needs more time just to get things right so that's lovely and then we've got a bit of primal scream moving on up um what else have we got uh groove rider fool's gold remix which is lovely um lonely soul by um by uncle um you know is uh is is, is perfect really for that sort of moment that's in the third episode talking about the sort of history of united and the, the the challenge ferguson's got to match busby and then um left field fat planet is playing at the start of the final which is nice it's sort of real sense of um sort of the the i don't know the sort of the, the mind's burn you know turning and burning as the the pressure mounts so you know got some great stuff in there how what old were you at the it? time Go on, how old was i 17 no, 16 yeah. And what what so you're kicking every ball musically as well when when you're that age. What what yeah. was your your personal soundtrack in in May of 1999? That is a really good question. That is so difficult. I was I was I'm in, I'm embarrassed to say that I was a big Oasis fan. So in terms of like, Why are you embarrassed? I'm embarrassed to say, well, because it's a I'm making a film about United. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 so I'm, I'm sure sort of... there are lots of United fans who are big Oasis fans. They're a Manchester group, first and foremost. And apparently uh, they're the only Manchester group in Manchester. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> All the others are in Panoma, <laughs> which oh, rhymes, exactly. of course, with Barcelona, <laughs> as we've already uh, testified to. No, but in the charts at the moment, uh, I'm sure you remember Sweet Light like Chocolate, that Shanks and Bigfoot. But, I mean, if, uh, an Oasis I do. Fan. Of course they do. Yeah. Stereophonics. Yeah, the Stereophonics, I, I, I don't really understand why they weren't bigger. I think they're a, they're a fabulous, fabulous band, Stereophonics, if, if you like that that kind of stuff. Uh, and in that that kind of post Britpop era, they're keeping a the flag alive for that kind of music. 
So well, is, yeah, is, they is were that... definitely they were definitely all over. I'm trying to I'm basically I'm just trying to go back and work out what albums it would be. It would an album would have come out around that time from you're, you're this is, I'm exposed. I'm exposing myself. Yeah, I mean that 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 point you were very much like it was albums, wasn't it? In the sense of you're listening to, but I'm just expo I'm exposing myself horrifically. Don't worry. At number three, Shania Twain. That don't impress me much. Uh, I mean, we did we did try to get sweet like chocolate in the Christmas party at the end of mm. episode one. But we ended up with Ex "Move Your Body" by Expansions, but it was um, that that was it. It felt a bit too on the nose, sweet like chocolate. I think. Oh, what was but, that? But well, no. The thing I would say about sweet like chocolate, it introduced or it broke what was then known as two step uh, musically into the charts. Got to number one, two step arguably would be the sort of precursor of um you know all sorts of formats that eventually lead to grime in terms of music this is yeah. kind of where the dance floor was going to at the time and it owned it two-step had been around a little bit underground and two-step is really from tottenham although some people further east might claim it as a musical format but that is still part of the narrative of you know the grime music of today i think that's a really significant moment it was only at number one for a week um, after that my missus started uh, working with them actually to try and write a song that would have been uh, the kind of follow-up to sweet like chocolate it never ever got there they did lots of things worked with them for a couple of weeks and it wasn't going anywhere so they abandoned the project and they couldn't get another hit they couldn't get another hit but like i say their job their purpose was to take two-step music out of the underground and put it the mainstream they did a really decent job with sweet light chocolate um well, but shania I twain just... i'm sorry i keep interrupting you no go go to... no i was just going to say i just checked i just checked and i my memory was that be here now was about that time and it was yes. 97 which obviously don't go away is from be here now so i'm just i'm just joining the dots i was talking it makes absolute yeah. sense. Mm -hmm. They're not featured in the charts at all, are they? On this particular, well, no, because that that was ninety seven. But the charts, we did we did a lot of haranguing of the charts to work out exactly if there was anything that we wanted to sort of get in. And as I said, like the because the Christmas party was um, was something we were very much trying to find the right tone for, but we weren't really sure what the players. I mean, what do you think the players would have been listening to in that dressing room? Oh, God, Lou, this is this is one for you, Dotton. Well, I don't know what they would have been listening to. I know, and I'm trying to say it for the third time, that don't impress me much at number three. Probably the strongest song in the charts, TLC's No Scrubs, I imagine the player... I still don't know what, what a scrub is. Well, Never it's, it's, the kind of, it it's the kind of gentleman that you wouldn't take home to meet your dad. Yeah, does that explain it? Like curly... I don't know in what way. Can you be more specific? <laughs> I what guess kind I of what kind of undesirable are we are we talking about? Yeah, well, they tell you exactly what kind of undesirable yeah. that they're talking about. So, would you like me to get the lyrics for you? Uh, no, no, not really. No, 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 no. it's worth no, no, no. <laughs> Give me just a moment. I'm putting them up right. The here. one, that, the one that gives me a trauma it's, here. Yeah, is a scrub is a guy that thinks he's fly. You with me? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. is also known as a buster always talking about what he wants and just sits on his broke ass. The broke ass bit, I think, is significant. He's a scrub because he scrubs floors, doesn't he? Because he's 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 got a broke ass. You know what I mean? Yeah, so are it's they moaning a... more more about the fact that he's an under that that he that uh, his personality no. is flawed or that he's just poor? I think that's a very good question. Have a listen to the next verse because basically he's come up to them or to one of them and says, look, baby, can I have my number? You know what fly guys are like. So he's a scrub is a guy that thinks he's fly. So he's like, hey, baby, can I have your number? And she says, so no, I don't want you. No, he says, hey, baby, here's my number. And she goes, no, I don't want your number. No, I don't want to give you mine. And no, I don't want to meet you nowhere. No, I don't want none of your time. And if you've been told that to uh, by a woman, particularly, you know, in the clubs is where you grow up and you learn to walk the plank. We used to call it walking the plank, which means you're walking across the dance floor when the DJ... Uh, without warning, decides to slow things down and the lights go down. 
you walk across the dance floor to try and chat up a girl and she's with her friends you know what's coming and it's a painful walk back but first of all she goes nah i wouldn't dance <laughs> with you if you're the last person in the dance floor so you have to walk back your head and all your friends are on the other side of the plane going, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and whilst they're dancing very closely with a woman, you're standing wondering where you should put your life, you know, put yourself. Does that explain the scrubs bit? Are you satisfied now? Yeah, yeah, more than uh, you I, would. Would. I think we're, we're, yeah. we've gone over from not enough information <laughs> to too much. Well, that's at number nine. <laughs> and it's a classic song. And I do think the young footballers would have been listening to that. Uh, mm. The Manchester United football squad might have been listening to the number 11 tune because it's by them. 1999, mm. Manchester United squad, Lift It High, All About Belief. Sam, do you remember that? It's a bit that of an name? Oasis rip-off, actually, that. Um, we, we actually had amazing footage for that, from them recording it, but we couldn't, I just couldn't fit it in. But it was... Um, you haven't got enough episodes, is it? You, you need I more know. episodes, clearly. It goes, quite, it goes quite quickly, three hours. But it's... Um, yeah, it's, no, the, it's it's quite catchy. Do you want to sing it, Dotton? Do you know? No, you I it? don't. No, and I won't sing the number twenty-one tune either, which is another one that I'm sure that they're playing in the dressing rooms because it was Beastie Boys' "Remote Control." Uh, Baby, I, one more time by Britney Spears at number no, twenty-four. I didn't didn't get beyond twenty. There's there's no, one mate. there's one that get, that traumatizes me, Go which on. is Backstreet Boys, because I'm, my stepdaughters. How old were they then? 99 yeah the old, the oldest one is is 12 yeah. and yeah. honestly i'm not joking now she would play this song yeah i want it yeah. all fucking night yeah okay just on a run over and over and over again Tim, and it just drove me it was mad 25 years ago you're not over it 25 not, no, years ago no, you're not over no, it not dear, dear. backstreet boys do you know what you've done to um an old school old what man. What happened to the the Jerry Halliwell solo career? And she's she's in I think top five. Right. Look yeah. at me. And wow. there, there's obviously a Madonna esque mm -hmm. attempt going on there. Mm -hmm. What happened? Did that fizzle out quickly? Yeah, very quickly. I don't even remember it. That's how quickly it fizzled out. Right. Do you remember it at all, Sam? Of course. Yeah, I was watching. I was looking at that. Um... Do you see the Robbie Williams doc a few which came out last year? There's mm. great footage of, of of the two of them together on holiday. Mm. Mm. And yeah, she's and she's a really it's a really it's just all weird, isn't it? Looking back at this sort of time. I think that's sort of it's lovely looking at like the texture of the charts. That Travis, I had Travis on the radio the other day. Mm. And that that actually took me back to this. And that and I thought, God, mm. you know, I couldn't I that made the scale basically that you've got these people like jerry halliwell and united you basically realize i can't really work out how to describe it other than to say that they they were such a big part of your life even though you were completely removed from them do you know what i mean the, the fact that we sort of know so much about jenny halliwell but none of us could think about actually what happened to her career but yet she's sort of there well she's an entertainer and she knows how to grab the headlines and good on her i i, I don't think we'd be talking about the Spice Girls today if it wasn't for, you know, the energy of Jerry Halliwell at this point, as it were. Yeah. Um, it's great tracks in the charts, by the way. It's Fat Boy Slim right here, right now, Skunk and Nancy secretly. But then if you go beyond number 20, Tim, you'll see it number 39. It's been in the charts eight weeks. It peaked at number two. And this was the introduction to the entire world of an artist known as Eminem with... My name is, my name is, my name is Slim Shady, um, Buster Rhymes. And, you know, to be fair to Eminem, he broke rap to a new audience. Mm -hmm. um, but then you realise the influence of rap. Look at Whitney Houston at number 41 with It's Not Right, But It's Okay. It is a kind of a, a rap-ing kind of tune. She's almost rapping mm -hmm. in it in a sort of a way. She's influenced like a lot of other people in the charts around one, if, if, if she's trying to modernize one that astonished me is brian adams 
cloud number nine. Yes. It's Brian yes. Adams going electronic. You know, it, 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 it's the, uh, the song. Is the, like, isn't, isn't that the real Brian Adams? Sorry to cut you. Isn't that the real Brian Adams? I've no uh, idea. I've never followed him. I've never I really liked so. him, you know. Well, because of that one song that was in the Robin Hood movie. Yeah, yeah. I've won forever yes. and ever and ever. But <laughs> it was so unlike Brian Adams. What are you going to do if you've got a song that gets to number one because of a movie? If it hadn't been in that movie, it would have been regarded and still would be as a great song. It is a great song, but people sort of, it's like that wet, wet, wet one, you know, love is in the air. It wasn't mm -hmm. even their song. It was a decent song before they did it. And then suddenly, because it's number one forever, everybody hates it now. I enjoyed rediscovering Fats and Small, Turnaround. Yes, yes, I enjoyed yes. Enjoyed that. And I love the fact that they released an album called uh, Fats What a Small Music. Now that's that, that's <laughs> that's genius. They, they, they deserve they deserve uh, success for that. But on the whole, I think the, the uh, one word that I'd use for a lot of this, it's kind of pleasant chart. Pleasant. Oof. And the yeah. the the reading, on, you know, there's, there's some hedonistic basement jacks and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and it, I've been away for five years at this point. And looking at England, I, I honestly felt I was looking at Fantasy Island. Because uh, it was this is before the Iraq War, you know, so the whole Tony Blair project is is untainted at this point, and 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 people seem seem to be loving it. But I was looking from afar, thinking, well, house prices are going whoosh, mm. wages are stagnant. There's only one thing keeping this whole thing together. And that's the credit card. Now, when we were young, there was no credit card. There's a thing called higher purchase. You know, you could buy things on the never, never, but that was for specific and usually quite big things. But by this time, the credit card is coming in. And that means an entire lifestyle on tick. And, and once you separate consumption from production, you're living in a fantasy world. You know, when we were kids, you're doing your paper round and you've got to save up, you've got to work X number of weeks on the paper round to buy the shirt that you want or whatever, you know. And when that's taken away, when th that relationship between work and, and consumption is taken away, people go into a fantasy world. And I, even at this time, I'm thinking, this cannot, this is not sustainable. This isn't. Because what it's going to do, it's going to build up a mountain of debt that in the end can't be paid. Hello, 2008. And we are still living with the aftermath of 2008 now. No one's found a way out from 2008 yet. But in those years before, especially now before the Iraq war, just the feeling I get from this chart, it's all very pleasant and it's all nice and it's all people having a good time and so on, but it's false. It's, it's, it's fantasy island. And every time I would come back and I would look around, I was thinking, this country just isn't real anymore. I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah. Does I think to me, Dutton? Well, to me, <laughs> when I go I'll off say, on these things, it never makes sense to him. No, but, no, you know, no, no. It makes sense to someone. But it's not that it doesn't make sense to me, and I can't disagree with you in terms of the um, the safe uh, landscape that a lot of this music provides. But I would say at number ninety two, it's been fourteen weeks in the charts. It's on its way down. Lauren Hill's X Factor from the album The Miseducation of Lauren Hill was so revolutionary. The concept of it, completely revolutionary. Remember what I said about the influence Fantastic. of rap? Yeah. The influence yeah. of rap music. She takes rap and turns it into a harmonious uh, sung experience, if I can put it that way, rather than spoken experience, because she's doing exactly what the rappers do, you know. She's telling a story, a very sort of uh, direct narrative, about the way things used to be, and in relationships or otherwise in this particular song. But the whole album takes you back to an era that we were you know, if you like, more revolutionary or otherwise, but we were getting on with our lives in a very um, organic way rather than the uh, way that you described, which is uh, much more monetary. Um, and I thought that was the best album probably of that decade and still one of the best albums today. So as safe as probably 90% of the charts are, there's one or two things in there. You're right. 
there's yeah, always there's always predators. there's always green shoots somewhere isn't there mm, but mm. you're right i think it's i think it's magnificent you're, you're right on yeah well it's been a pleasure speaking to you again uh you know uh, sam uh anytime you want to come on i thought the conversation today was really really of a quality level and i'd be surprised if uh listeners don't go and tune in to your documentaries as well yeah sell it this is your opportunity sam collins come up come on down and sell your documentary what is it what's it called where can we watch it documentary series is called 99 it's on amazon prime uh worldwide i think why it did you call a... it 99 red balloons no um, no it's 99 with a flake <laughs> but all of the above it's all things to all people mm -hmm. um it is it is a story about um 15 people trying to become immortal and um you know and 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 what's at stake if they don't and i hope that anybody who watches it will find something whether they are a united fan whether they're a football fan sport fan or whether they caesar. hate all of those julius exactly caesar. well because julius caesar wants to try and become immortal and what happens when he doesn't he gets it in the back, doesn't he? Beware the eyes of those corners. Exactly. And Tim exactly. doesn't like corners, as listeners to the Brazilian shirt um, label know. Doesn't like them. He thinks goals that are scored from a corners should be discounted. Or yeah. they should count less, you know, yeah, well, in which yeah. case, if they count a half a goal, then United drew this game when we go into extra time. <laughs> well, look, as, a, as, as a Tottenham fan, I've shared that thought, Tim. Yeah. That's, 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 that's season. I'm glad to hear where it comes from, because I've often wondered. <laughs> now, it's an absolute pleasure. Sam Collins, many thanks, Tim. You good? Thanks, guys.